Food is the basis of life on the blue planet. The Food Future Foundation has been set up to build a better planet for people by adopting a whole of society approach and is aligned with the vision of the UN Food System Summit 2021. The foundation envisions to be the catalyst for food system transformation in India and across the globe. The foundation would provide system leadership to lead and steer change in narrative, build food system leadership for change, develop networks and alliances, facilitate cross-learning. We aspire to change the narrative by creating a knowledge hub. And through our Food Systems Leadership Academy, we will build leadership for change through intervention at school level and by continuing the mentorship during higher education. This would help develop change agents for food system transformation. The foundation would help create a food innovation hub that would develop network and alliance between farmers, businesses, consumers and citizens. The foundation is working to bring about food transformation in low and middle income countries and promote cross-learning. We at Food Future Foundation firmly believe, never doubt, that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Let's join hands to build a better food future that is food secure, nature positive and aimed at a healthy tomorrow both for our people and the planet. Hello and welcome and a very happy new year to you all, the panelists and all the viewers who are joining in today. This is the first webinar of the new year and in fact of the new decade. And we have just the perfect book to start this new phase. It is called Fix It With Food. Superfoods should become super healthy. We all know how important uh, food is, um, at all times, and especially during these times of the pandemic and how important it is to be healthy from the inside. And I'm delighted to have with us a distinguished panel who will talk to us about the book and their views about food and how it works uh, towards prevention and good health. Uh, we are delighted to have with us the well-renowned endocrinologist, Dr. Amrish Mittal. Among his many honors, is the Padma Bhushan, the third highest Indian civilian award for his outstanding contribution to the field of medicine. Welcome to the program. Dr. Shikha Sharma has helped innumerable people lose weight using comprehensive health and diet management programs by bringing technology together with baby nutrition. Welcome to the program, Dr. Sharma. And Kavita Deshka. Is, uh, Kavita Devgan is an acclaimed nutritionist who focuses on weight loss and holistic health. She is the author of Don't Diet, 50 Habits of Thin People, and Ultimate Grandmother Hacks. And of course, the book we are discussing today, Fix It With Food. Welcome to the program, Kavita. And since you are the author, we will kick off with you. What was the driver behind this book? Uh, hi, Jocelyn, and thank you, everyone, Dr. Mittal, Dr. Shikha. So lovely to be in this panel with you. Learned so much from both of you, and it's absolutely my delight to be here talking to with both of you. And Jocelyn, thank you for agreeing to do this lovely uh, panel discussion. This book is really, really close to my heart. I I'll tell you how this came about. Uh, there is this huge marketing-driven... Uh, Somehow, uh, I felt a push towards certain foods in the industry, which I felt needed a little correction. I felt that just because a food doesn't really have a marketing budget behind it doesn't mean it's good for you. It's not good for you. The idea behind this book was to tell everybody just how good the everyday foods that we eat are for us. 
you know, I thought, and that's what my writing and my talking also, uh, you know, told me that the moment a person really comes to know what a particular food is going to do for one's body, it makes a little difference in the way that person will look at that food. So I decided that I'm going to write a book which is about, you know, foods that you can actually just go out and buy from your local sabziwala and tell everybody such enticing facts about them that the next time they look at them, they will give them a little more respect that they give them right now. So that was the genesis of the book. That's how I started writing it. And once I started writing, it was difficult to stop because my research, you know, told me much beyond my expectations just how good these everyday subsidies and the veg the fruits that we eat are, with, which we eat without giving them a thought. So right. The idea was to tell them just how good these everyday foods can be, even if they don't hear enough about them in the media. Oh, that that's a very well way, uh, a nice way to put things together. And um, just like it was difficult for you to stop writing, I think for most of us it was difficult to stop reading. The book, yeah. uh, Doctor Mittal. Um, you know when Kavita says that through food, uh, especially local food, you can prevent disease. Do you agree with that, or how how do you go about it? Are we able better. to hear it? This is better. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I said we are what we eat, basically. You can't get yeah. away from that. And food plays a key role in our overall health, not just physical, also mental health. And I think right. it's uh, it's the way Kavita does it is very nice. And, and that's sort of welcome. And it communicates very well The and simplifies complexities. But coming right. back to the connection, there is a strong connection between diets and all kind of disease. Uh, right. Most of our modern day disorders, the non-communicable disorders that we talk about, which is, of course, you talk about diabetes, you talk about high blood pressure, heart disease, even cancer. All of them have a strong connection to changes in our dietary habits. Right. So, so there has been a lot of change with economic development, not just in India, but in countries across the world. As economic development happens, the pattern of food consumption changes. And as she said very rightly, it's marketing that takes over. And therefore, people get driven to, for example, soft drinks, uh, sodas, they call them in the US, you know. So, and, and, and you may not get safe water in many parts of India, but you will get those so called cold drinks or soft drinks everywhere. Okay. So, 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 this is important to understand that if your diet changes, and in, 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 in very brief, I'll, I'll highlight those changes, just underline those changes. One is an increase in sugar content of diet, overt sugar content, mm -hmm. an increase in hidden sugar consumption, which means sugars that you don't see, don't realize, they're not genie, they're not sugar, but they're there. An increase in refined carbohydrates overall, which means things like we often don't think of uh, you know, uh, white chapatis or white bread or white, uh, you know, shiny white rice as being a source of sugar, a carbohydrate kind of thing. So increase in refined carbohydrate. Number two is reduction in fiber. They both go together. Number three is overall lower protein intakes, which is often the bane of Indian diets. Mm -hmm. And mixing bad fat and good fat. We mix up uh, you know, we think all fat is bad and some people say all fat is good. So we have to distinguish good fat and bad fat. And we can do that as we go along. But what I'm saying is that it is the way we look at these things. So these changes have happened over the last few decades. And while we have we have succeeded increasing our lifespan and so many people living uh, to 80s and 90s now with good medical care, we have not succeeded in in many cases improving the quality of life because we are getting hit by non-communicable disease because of change in our dietary habits and exercise but that's separate but definitely change in dietary habits so undoubtedly there's a strong link there you know in uh, in places like america since you mentioned america japan even in um, united kingdom you find that people with 
these new dietary habits are now taller, broader, fairer, yes. many yes. other things. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? No, I think uh, it's, it's a very good uh, example. I'm glad you said that. There are a lot of gaps in our traditional diets. And right. one of the major gaps is protein. Yes. So when our families, they live abroad, our own brothers, sisters, cousins, their kids are strapping young men. They are bigger yes. than, than our athletes. You know, and that is because their natural protein content in the diet goes up substantially and also physical activities encouraged more. So these combine to so obviously we are not realizing our potential for for right. growth if we are not getting adequate protein and calories. A quick example is Japan, for example, at the end of the Second World War, the heights. And if you compare the heights now, there is a huge difference with the same genes. Right. It's simply because they were eating grass at that time at times, and now they're one of the wealthiest nations in the world. So, so, so it makes a big difference to your structure. Uh, Shikha, I'll uh, carry the same question to you. You know, when uh, when we talk about all these countries where now people are taller and kind of healthier, whether healthier or at least more muscular, um, you know, they are of course eating better, but they are also eating food which is pumped with. Uh, artificial protein artificial uh, vitamins etc do you think that is helping us or causing a problem so see fundamentally a lot depends on uh, uh, you know what kind of uh, purchaser you are like for example uh, the vegan movement started uh, from the west uh, am i audible yes you are yes you are yeah. loud and clear so for example yeah, so the vegan movement started from the West. And similarly, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, if you are living in California, you're more likely to be healthy than if you're living Midwest. So in Midwest, you would have the, uh, you know, the, the rib steaks and you would have the, uh, yeah, the sodas and you would have those uh, oxytocin pumped uh, milk. Uh, you would have growth hormone infused protein. So it depends a lot on what which part of America you're living. So if you're living in the more, uh, I would say, uh, the more educated, the more refined, uh, then they are choosing fresh, they're choosing organic, they're choosing all that. So it depends. See, fundamentally, our world is very stratified. We live in a very stratified world where there are certain certain sections of people who don't get two square meals a day. And there are certain sections of people who are getting the best of uh, organics, the best of fruits, the vegetables. They're more evolved. They have access to everything. And then, of course, then you have a large chunk of the middle class who just eats whatever is available in the super, supermarket at the best value or the best uh, deal they get. And yeah. I think what we are really talking about is, is that this large chunk of middle class who, who go for value rather than quality. So if they get potatoes at two rupees better cost, they wouldn't bother about why is it cheaper? Uh, is it cheaper because it is uh, uh, because maybe the distributor network uh, is giving a better price or maybe because they don't have the in-between uh, sellers or is it cheaper because uh, it could be, uh, say, uh, modified in some way. Like, for example, a lot of genetically modified food uh, is also percolating countries. Uh, so it depends a lot on uh, who is the purchaser, who's, uh, who's purchasing the food and what is his level of uh, awareness, what is his level of access. Uh, but yes, uh, the... The question today is that uh, do people know about the food enough? Like, for example, if you talk to somebody about a protein powder, nine out of 10 people would think, oh, it's that protein powder, which uh, the body, uh, you know, the weightlifters eat. But that's not true. There are different kinds of protein powder. Similarly, if people talk about sugar. Then there is, there is a uh, section of people who say, oh, sugar is something which I must have. Otherwise, I'll, I'll have low BP. Yes, so there is some some strange connection between not uh, having sugar and low BP. So it depends a lot on who's the consumer, what is his level of education, what is level of access. Because see, everything is available today. It, everything is available today. It depends on what you make. So it, a lot depends on choices. And that's why I think I must congratulate Kavita that you know these kind of books are required. Because if you're educated, if you are aware and you want to make the best choice, is there something which is simple, which will help you make that right choice? Because ultimately, it's your choice which really matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is what the book focuses on, Kavita, that, um, you know, to eat uh, not the so-called exotic foods. Like, you don't need, say, an 
acai berry or something you can just have amla or any of the locally available food which we have grown up with or even our ancestors knew all about the point is that there are alternatives available for everything yeah. you know so as long as you identify your needs so if you're looking for vitamin c then you don't need to look beyond amla it's as simple as that half an amla will give you your full days uh, vitamin c needs it will meet your full days vit uh, vitamin c needs similarly kale is you know marketed worldwide as this great vitamin a source but i don't yeah. think too many people know that sweet potato gives much more vitamin a you know our local shakarkandi gives much more vitamin a than kale probably would at like 120th of the cost maybe i'm not saying that everything exotic is bad but everything has to be need based what is your need and what can you afford and what is more locally sourceable obviously locally sourceable will be i mean with no rocket science it will have more nutrients there will be less nutrient loss so the point is to make wise choices that was the whole idea actually behind the book you know because we live in really toxic times i mean there is no denying the fact both tangible you know the ones that you can see and the non tangible stresses that we deal with you know stuff like pollution yeah. and stress and everything so what we eat eventually is the only tool we have in hand which can ensure whether we stay healthy or like as dr mittal said we succumb to the modern day diseases which most of us are succumbing to so that is why i try to list foods you know so that no one can say no i can't afford good food what is good food right. the whole definition needs to change of of superfood i personally believe yeah you know um, it reminds me of a, a small uh, anecdote um the doctor uh, prescribed black seeds so when when i went to the market i think one small jar was for 500 rupees and when i went to the local grocer and said alsi de do it was hardly 100 rupees a kilo or something yeah so yeah. uh, so we do get caught up in all these diet uh, faddish diets don't we dr mitra i think uh, you see uh, the problem that we face as physicians as endocrinologists is that when you advise people what is a generally what is generally a healthy diet for weight loss or for diabetes or generally is very boring it has it has it, it's not sexy at all you know it's <laughs> what is this we all know this what are you telling us but the yeah. problem is that's what it is and you know it's people like kavita and shikha and others who made it very interesting for 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 yeah. people at large but the fact is that a regular healthy diet is not that complicated yeah. and therefore people are looking for specific answers they look for answers like tell them one component of diet you completely omit or one component you have all day then they love that you know yeah. tell them you can have a little bit of this little bit of that it doesn't it doesn't go down mm -hmm. well so therefore mm -hmm. fats develop the other reason why fats in diet are so common is because the truth is the science of nutrition is still very primitive and there are a lot of answers we don't have for our patients okay so therefore there is there is a there are gray zones and that's where people mm -hmm. sort of get into so people like to look for things that will give quick results not realizing that yeah. nutrition is a chronic sort of situation where you have to do the same thing over and over again for weeks to months to years to get good results whereas people want quick fix they want quick control of diabetes quick quick blood loss you know uh, uh, sorry weight loss all those kind of things and therefore they fall for all these things and therefore the all kinds of fads come in and every fad not today if you ask people uh, why don't you ask me about atkins diet no one asks me about At atkins diet these days i said what happened uh, i mean 3 years ago 4 years ago everyone was only pummeling me about atkins diet you don't tell us enough about that then it became you know what paleo diet everyone was saying you don't know doctor that is by far the best diet to follow paleo diet okay then it's it's became keto diet which is still there and we can talk about it later if you like and then of course intermittent fasting so all these diets have some merits and some demerits you know yeah. so the thing is that people are looking for something exciting that will give them a very structured schedule and will tell them okay do this for 6 weeks and you will be much better not realizing that whatever dietary changes actually have to be induced have to stay with them so they have to be pragmatic and follow diets that they can follow on a longer term 
So, for example, keto diet, if you follow, you will follow it for two months, three months. You can't follow it beyond that. Or if you do the diabetes reversal programs, very popular these days, very low calorie diets, 800 calorie diets. Now, they can't be done unless you're under supervision and they can't be done forever. They can be done for 12 weeks, maybe 14 weeks, but you can't do them for for like months and months together. So the idea is that when you go to extreme diets, then it has to be under medical supervision and with the medical clearance of a doctor. And you have to understand the implications of what you're doing. What is the long term impact? Not just, OK, I've lost weight immediately, but maybe you don't know it may have damaged your body in the long run. So I think we need to uh, understand that there are no shortcuts. There are no quick fixes. Uh, you can make a, a diet which has a lot of variety based on the advice my friends will give you. And you can have a diet around the year which is healthy without going crazy about it and without going into something that is really exotic. Having said that, one line about uh, exotic foods, and sometimes they're very good. Yes. You see, as I was mentioning earlier uh, in uh, before the program, that you know things that are that are that are now local were foreign once. Right. I mean, you don't Im imagine life without tomatoes. You don't like quinoa is foreign now, but quinoa is now being grown here. Mm. Our millets are coming back. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the government is encouraging growth of millets. So it has to be a mix of all things. And you have to, it's all about making the right choices, as Shikha said. That makes all the difference. Uh, Shikha, um, Dr. Sav has talked about, um, you know, um, a lot of what we consider to be traditional, whether it is vegetables or fruits or even grains, but they don't really belong uh, to this region at all. How do you think um, that makes a difference to our health? See, so, so you do follow the, the Vedic uh, principles, you're the best person to talk about this. Yes, so first I'll tell you why I got onto this whole Vedic thing. So when I was uh, working as a junior doctor in cardiology at Panth Hospital and I, I saw people getting a heart attack and actually dying on the table right in front of my eyes. And as a very young doctor, it, it kind of uh, shocked me because, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in our families, girls normally don't go to even a, a, a burial ground or, or somewhere where, you know, so, so I'd never seen a death before in my entire life. The, the first series of deaths I saw was as a doctor. But the, uh, but the ICU was like the biggest one because every day I was seeing people dying uh, in very dramatic ways. And that's what set me thinking that there has to be a better way uh, to, to save lives, which could be done as a, in a systems approach. So, for example, as, a doc as doctors, we are trained in systems approaches. So it's not right. that uh, we are miracle workers. We are trained to do certain things in a certain way. And that's why the outcomes are far better. Now, when I looked, when I started looking at a preventive healthcare approach, and I looked at nutrition, and I, then I looked at uh, uh, what the Chinese medicine was doing, or the Chinese philosophy, or the Greek philosophy, uh, and the Indian philosophy, I thought there were certain things which could be taken from each philosophy. And that's how the Vedic nutrition part came in, uh, into our, uh, how uh, we started structuring the entire, uh, for example, let me give you an example, like, you know, I had become a doctor, but so many times, we were advising curd to patients, even at night. And one day, I remember a patient telling me that, look, doctor, I mean, our grandparents never allowed uh, us to have curd at night. And you as a doctor is giving me curd. Are you sure? And that set me thinking there's something I don't know, uh, which I need to know. Because obviously, the patient knows something which I don't know. And that's how the whole journey started of Vedic nutrition, understanding the body types, understanding how the weather impacts, the, you know, the post-digestive impact of foods and all of that. Now, coming back to, in practice, what really happened and what Dr. Uh, uh, you know, Amrish, Amrish Mittal also very correctly pointed out is that when you try to give common sense to people, it's very boring. It's exceptionally boring because that's what they've heard their nannies talk about and their dadis talk about. And they're not going to hear that common sensical approach. So how a structured approach, and then I looked at the US. I looked at the how in US uh, the markets were working and how uh, you know, their, uh, their clinics were working. And what I realized is that ultimately when people look for a solution, they look for a solution outside of what they already know, outside of what they've already, what they perceive they have done. So they perce their perception was, I've already done this and it won't work on me anymore. Give me something different. And that's how the whole thought process came that 
if you really have to help people change their dietary habits, which are fundamentally uh, ingrained from childhood. So what you're trying to achieve is basically changing their childhood habits, which is not no, it's not an easy task at all. You have to put them into a structure the way when we go to school, we switch on. We switch on right. into the mode. When we come back home, we switch on into the home mode. So we have this whole flip button, which we switch on and switch off. So I thought that is the structure which is required. And the biggest thing in food, what I've realized is that people want to have fun. Yeah. And, and that is why when Dr. Mittal uh, explained, and I used to wonder that why are they doing this keto diet? And why are you doing this Atkins? I mean, it won't. But what I realized underlying was that people, when they look at food, they look at fun. For them, that is fun. Otherwise, it's office, home, office, home, responsibilities, office, home. So what do you think? I mean, and, and this, I'm digressing a little bit. When the lockdown mm -hmm. happened, what was the first food people queued up to buy? And they were largely charged, but they still went and bought it. That was alcohol. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and the first thing which opened world, uh, nationwide, the, uh, the wine shops opened nationwide. They're the first thing, the first shops which opened nationwide. So fundamentally, you know, uh, you know, while as, as healthcare professionals, we want the best for our patients. But the reality is that for people, food is a sense of pleasure. Food is a sense of excitement. Food is a sense of entertainment. It's and at some points also recreation. Right. You know, when people, so for example, when, when, and I'm talking to very, 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 very uh, things which mm. I've noticed in, in my quest for finding that how do I help my patients? So if you really go to a party, the first thing people talk about is what they ate yesterday and how they're planning for the next dinner on the weekend. So this great <laughs> restaurant is so now, do you really think that people like Kavita and me are going to tell them, no, please have. Yeah. Amla, because it's good for you and they'll actually eat it? No, they will not eat <laughs> Kavita, so I'm with you on this. This is exactly the problem we are having as, as people in healthcare that how do you get right. people to do the commonsensical thing which is good for them? So one of the information which Kavita has clearly come up with a, a book which I should be reading now because one is information. The second is how do you make fun? How do you make food yeah. fun? And that's where all these fun recipes come. So if you look at an American site, you will see this one to wintergreen smoothie with a dash of quinoa or a dash of lime or a dash of something exotic. And if you really look at why Indian food the youngsters don't want to eat, it's because it says boiled loki or boiled tori or something which, which sounds typically very boring. And you're yeah. expecting a 15 year old to eat that when he's taking his girlfriend out for uh, lunch? I don't think so. It doesn't second, work that way. No, no way. Second thing is very important is, see, this is a new generation we're talking about. They have grown up on uh, pizza in 30 minutes. So I have a serious doubt they're going to be eating the kind of food which you're talking about. Because they have grown up that every birthday party had 30-minute pizza delivery. That every office party has a 30-minute pizza delivery. which And it comes free with sodas. You know, so that you get a pizza, you get the soda free. The issue would be what will happen to this generation unless there is fun because pizza is fun. Roti right. is not. I mean, just look at, I mean, anybody who has kids, when they come back from home from on a hot summer day, what do they say? Khane mein kya hai? And if you say dal hai, roti hai, sabzi hai, what happens? They just, if they, they get to work, they'll dial for pizza. Absolutely. I think you can. Yeah. Please. Yeah. You know, what you're saying is very interesting that the food has to be fun or as Dr. Mittal says, it has to be sexy. But it, there, there is also, since you mentioned people are going towards wine shops during the pandemic, I think there is also this need to um, eat and drink what is comfort food and to find that, that there's nothing wrong with it. And so when Kavita talks about the fact that you know, certain things like bananas, potatoes, um, mangoes. Um, I'm sure Dr. Mittal has a lot of uh, uh, patients who come and say, Ham aam khana to nahi chhod sakte hai. that is one thing I have to eat. Right. So, um, uh, so Kavita, you, you've done a wonderful job of putting this forth that these foods are not really bad for you. 
So my right. book actually lists uh, potato, mango, you know, a whole lot of other foods which are banana, which are considered bad. These three are considered actually, you know, person goes on a diet and when I actually ask a person to eat a banana a day, they look aghast at me. They're like, I think she's mad or maybe we come to the wrong place. Literally, I yeah. get that reaction to like, explain to them. Right. And then I ask them to just read that. Now I just ask them to read the chapter on banana. My work is easier now. The fact is that all these foods have somehow been made into bad foods because of misinformation. All right. of these, mango is a brilliant food for us. In season, it's the best food to eat. Similarly, right. banana is a wonderful, it's a complete food. It's a food which is not very highly calorific. I don't know where people got this information, uh, idea that it's very, very high calories. You know, eggs are considered bad. So all of these foods are brilliant for us and we need to eat them. And they all are part of the 40 uh, foods, actually the superfoods that I've uh, listed in the book. Right. I personally feel, you know, uh, what Shikha was saying was really, I mean, because these are practical problems of every day that we face every day with clients, how to actually get them to eat food which is good for them. I mean, that's an everyday challenge. So one thing that I've tried and which has worked very, very well is I never say no to anything, literally. And that's how this book also came about. Because I realized the moment I say no to say cake, that's all the person right. will think. That's all the person will think of, you know. So the better strategy is to make sure that the good food crowds out the bad, you know. So if you ask a person that you know a person hunger time is 5.30, you make sure that in the diet plan, the person eats, say, a fruit or some, if it's summer, then maybe a glass of buttermilk at about, say, 4, 4.30. That will take the edge of the hunger. So the point is to include so many good foods in the diet. You, you can only eat so much in right, the day. Yeah. You know? So if you start eating healthier food, because in any case, I have never believed that the way to weight loss or to uh, prevention of health uh, you know, of diseases is removing foods or counting calories. That has never right. been worked and that never will work. A better way is to start eating healthier food, which is good for you. And the calories take care of themselves, literally. You know, and when the calories take care of themselves, then the diseases and the weight loss also takes care of itself. So making food fun is very important. But at the same time, a sudden, not a sudden, in fact, a subtle and slow change in habits, you know, is also very, very important. Because yeah. when a person yeah. realizes over a little period of time how good they start feeling just by making a few changes in the way they are eating, then they will never go back to their old ways. But if you ask them, close your eyes, just follow this diet for like a month or two months, lose your five, seven, eight kilos. Then on the 31st day after that month, they will go back to the original diet and gain back faster. Yeah. And what uh, keto diets and now thank you, uh, Dr. Mittal, you brought that up. It's such a pain. All these fat diets, there's a new diet every season. There's a new fad literally every season. And People like me and Dr. Shikhan also, who do not really believe in these fat diets. I'm sure there's a whole new challenge every season now, how to counter this new diet when yeah. the clients come up with them, you know? The yeah. point is that anything that sounds too good to be true is probably too good to be true. Um, but, uh, Kavita, you, may, um, you mentioned uh, calories. Uh, yeah. I have a question here from Mr. D.C. Patak from uh, Gurgaon. He says, what should the daily calorie intake for a healthy and mobile senior citizen be? Okay. Now, again, calories are very, very individualized. You know, right. it's going to depend totally on, you know, your lifestyle, your mm. uh, body weight at present, right? And also the protein mass in your body and your activity level. Right. But on average, senior citizen probably is above 60. That's what I presume, Right. So when can specify? Okay, so around 1400 to 1600 calories, if he's moderately active or is he sedentary, should be fine for him. Dr. Mittal, uh, you know, very, very, very individualized. So, just yes, absolutely. I, I, I want to just add something here. Uh, yeah. And that is something which, uh, you know, I would want uh, everyone to just think about is, you know, the word calorie comes from the Latin word caloros. Yeah. Okay. And, 
basically this whole terminology came when steam engines were being created and okay. steam engines use a process called combustion which is burning so you take coal you burn it and it produces heat which is called a calorie uh, it's a temperature difference or one difference uh, one degree temperature difference when it you know brings about that's called a calorie and uh, in the lecture in the uh, these physicists and uh, these chemists had given the lecture and at that time human nutrition was being researched so unfortunately right. what a lot of people do even today is that uh, you know they like you know like if you give a work to some junior kid they copy and paste from google so they copied and pasted the word calorie from steam engines just combustion which is burning into human energy which is metabolism which is completely different now why okay. i say that this whole unfortunate incident happened uh, and it uh, and today calorie has become the you know it's it's, it's the main uh, language of nutrition uh, which is un, which is not really founded in science because combustion is when you burn something and it never goes back but whereas we all know that when we eat an iron or a vitamin in a fruit it actually stays alive and it is converted into human iron or heme in the hemoglobin and similarly when you eat a protein it is not destroyed or combusted there is no combustion it actually metabolism rearranges that molecule in a different structure okay and unfortunately how who can who enlightened me about this whole calorie concept was this young kid who came to me and uh, we were uh, prescribing uh, that kid about a 1800 calorie diet for weight loss and you know what he tells me he says look doc you want me to eat 1800 my hot chocolate fudge is how many calories i said about 1100 he said i get that i drink that hot chocolate fudge of 1100 calories and i still have balanced calories and i can even have a small piece of chocolate and right. i had no answer i had no answer for him because he he told me look this is your calorie concept and i i can lose weight because ultimately you're saying calorie in and calorie out so that mm-hmm. kid made me go back to the books and actually question what was there in the books and that's how we had to kind of uh, we look at what we were advising our patients in terms of calories and what kavita mentioned very well was you know we get to uh, we get too uh, enamored by counting calories and there are apps which help you count calories but that doesn't work because a the fundamental is wrong the calorie fundamental is wrong to begin with secondly when you're eating well there are ways mysterious ways as dr mittal had said that we don't understand food enough it's still a, a science which is evolving there are ways in which the body resets its whole balance there is a gut microbiome uh, which is coming up which you know which you have to understand is an intelligent system by itself so right. just by, can, by so what i'm thought trying to say is our body is not a steam engine and our body right. is not energy in and energy out and that's why right. for a lot of people who are counting calories they go wrong and they actually don't lose weight they put on they end up many times putting on weight yeah that's a that's a very important point isn't it Uh, Dr. Mittal, I also want to ask you. You know what she said about um, uh, calories. You can have the entire intake at one go, and have a, um, a you know a, a soda or some sort, a chocolate fudge. And um, I used to have uh, um, a dream boat and a uh, a cup of soup, and I thought I had uh, it was a great diet. Uh, but I want to ask you, um, you know. we've talked about how foods have changed over the decades one of the things is grain you know just like we have um, um, our farming methodologies have changed and we are you know we now look at genetic modification of uh, grains that too has affected our systems hasn't it for example I mean, now it's... more and more people are uh, becoming intolerant to gluten or at least uh, sensitive to gluten i mean i think the grains have undergone a big change and the, there's a history behind this because yeah. when when we were originally hunter gatherers and as people started settling by the river rivers and the concept of living in cities came about there was no way that people could have any enough food by just killing animals so yeah. therefore the concept of farming or cultivation started and and that's how grains actually probably are the reason why the human race survived that maybe would have been extinct yeah. so grains are very important for survival okay initially what has happened down the years is that we've kind of messed with the grain to improve their productivity and do a lot of things so that the 
good things about the grains have often been extracted and what is coming to our table is actually only the starch or the carbohydrate kind of grain and the minerals and the fiber is all gone that is a yeah. challenge so intrinsically grains are not bad grains are required by us but what kind of grain and how to do it and the fact that the wheat that we are probably eating today is different from the wheat eaten maybe 50 60 years ago uh, is is very important so so the processing really does it to the grain and while it saved human kind from uh, starvation you know when you yeah. so why why is there so much high carbohydrate intake in our country is because uh, you know when you have a large population where starvation is a big problem the cheapest and the best mass produced way is to have a lot of grain yeah you know that's the only way to get high quality vegetables is always a challenge to get good quality protein is always more expensive so you have grains which are carb rich and the population just thrives on that so that's what has happened now that has become a problem because we've gone yeah. the other way and 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 we have processed grains and very high refined carb content so so one of the things that we forget and i i, I think both kavita and shikha uh, alluded to it little bit is the first of course is behavioral change is very important if you've grown up eating a particular kind of food it is very very difficult for you to shift gears i know people who go on these uh, multi million dollar cruises and and they actually carry a Uh, their own chef with them an indian chef because they only want that kind of food so f- as you said food is a very important human food relationship is very important it's almost like having an affair so to break it to break it is not that easy we can't just tell them you break it and it's going to break it's not going to yeah. happen like that the other thing we forget is the portion size so right. obviously bananas are a very rich source of nutrients as is mango but we sometimes get carried away and patients don't often like being told portion sizes i'll give you two recent examples i had this uh, and both young boys this uh, uh, young sikh boy who who uh, who got obsessed with carrots and he just kept having carrots all day and i you know i couldn't figure out why his skin was orange i had never seen that that color of skin and i was planning a whole list of investigations when i said let's start with your diet and 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 oh, he was only having carrots okay yeah. because carrots are good for him and he got hooked on to it i mean it's a, it's a bit of a psychological problem but nevertheless it happens similarly at the start of the pandemic a couple of months after the pandemic not me one of my younger colleagues they called me up and said sir i'm going to send you a picture this guy is totally yellow I said how yellow oh what is God. that but but his bill ribbon is normal i said what the hell is that he only has haldi all day because haldi protects you from all those kind of things these are real life actual things so portion control so everything is good if taken in the right measure mangoes are allowed for a diabetic if taken in the right quantity and the right time but not like if you start living off mangoes so so these are the challenges uh, that we face in our day to day things and i i i think it's uh, important for us not to cut our patients uh, when they're describing their food not to cut them short right and i said they are in love with their food we all have our our, our food weaknesses so so mm. so you have to just get around it a little bit yeah maybe you could do that why don't you try doing it like twice a week or something and let's put this one there and said try this this will work better if you say you can't have this it will never work it has never worked you know so you have to play with human psychology a lot yes kavita Yeah, I you so called mill, uh, you know wheat. I mean, there is just this thing that I want to point out here that we keep talking, even we as nutritionists and doctors, we keep talking about variety, variety, eat color, eat a lot of vegetables, eat different kind of fruits, you can eat all colors. The same principle applies to grain. No one thinks of that. So people do not stick to just one or two kind of grains, and that's where you start going wrong. The moment right. you start the way you eat a different vegetable every day, if you try and incorporate these three to four kind of grains in your diet, maybe even more, there are so many of them around. You know, half the yeah. problem will be solved because each grain, like each vegetable and like each fruit, does something different for us, something good for us, which is intrinsic to that grain. You know, so that rule of eat variety should move on to the grains as well. I feel, which is very important. I just want so, to. So, so in, in the traditional um, plate, we have things like bajra and jowar ki roti and all these things. So yeah. it makes sense, doesn't it, to go back to that? This is a question to all three. So whoever chips in first. 
Absolutely. The point is that, you know, all these ancient grains earlier also, they were all eaten by rotation. The rotation mm -hmm. is actually the right word, which is true for fruits, vegetables, again, for oils as well, if we manage to talk about it. But for grains as well, whatever three, four, five grains one can, you know, really take liking to, or even if not liking for the sake of health, eat it once, eating once a week, bajra, even if you don't like it, is not such a tall order, you know, you could do yeah. it for the sake of your health. Similarly, ragi, similarly, there are so many of them. Amrant Amrant. is there. Amrant. Yeah, so obviously, yeah. by default, the consumption of wheat and rice will go down. Instead of telling someone you can only eat wheat twice a day, a better way would be to say that, you know, why don't you have Amrant like on Monday and Wednesday and have, you know, ragi, any millet on, say, Tuesday and Thursday and weekends you can eat your wheat. That I've seen works better with people because they don't feel tricked. In fact, they feel that they're being given a variety to eat. Yeah. And that works far better. Uh, Dr. Mittal, you know, when we talk about traditional uh, uh, grains, we talk about traditional diets, are they always good? Is that the right way to look at it? Well, uh, firstly, traditions vary a lot between different parts yeah. of India and depending on where you are. So not all, everything that's traditional is good, but a lot yeah. of it is. So neither can we bunk it, like junk it all and say this is all nothing, which is there is a lot of value in our tradition and a lot of amazing stuff. And there's a logic behind it, which we sometimes don't have the bandwidth to understand or go deep yeah. enough into. There is a logic between certain foods being good during certain parts of the year, certain seasons, mm -hmm. certain times of the day. There is some logic right. there. So I think we have to extract the best, best from that. But we also don't have to follow it blindly. We have to intermesh it with new information and, and newer options that we are getting. Yeah, yeah, so I absolutely. think that will be the probably the ideal situation. One line I'll say, I was uh, doing this program on Doordarshan again with uh, a lot of young uh, students. I think they were Khalsa College students and it was a Q&A kind of program. So they said, you've told us so much about food and so many things, but you haven't told us where will we get it? Because the that's only thing that we, the only thing that's available in the canteens and cafeterias and places around are the burgers or the tiki or this or that mm -hmm. samosas. That's what we have. So where do we get all this? So as you know, we have to make the environment more friendly for health. The food environment. At present, our environment has copied the West. Has become obesogenic. You know it. it, right. it promotes obesity. So I think that's also important. When we say you should have these choices, we are not always talking to wealthy people who can spend a lot of time on their food every day and have an army of people doing that. We're talking of regular students or, or people who are going to work. I mean, they need to have healthy options, which are often missing. Absolutely. Um, Shika, I want to ask you a question based, based on this. You just said that, you know, it's fashionable then to have the 30 minute pizza. And this is where I think a lot of people get fast food wrong because, uh, you know, our traditional tiffin is also fast food and will also arrive within 30 minutes and is actually a much healthier choice. Like if you're having idlis or dosas or vadas, those kind of things, isn't it? Uh, sorry, just in, in between, I lost the question. Can you repeat your question? I mean, See, basically, I was talking about the difference between junk food and fast food. So our traditional tiffin is actually fast food, but not junk food. You okay. Agree? Okay. See, fundamentally, first is that uh, fast food, if you mean that quickly you can get something. I mean, you can get a lot of health foods which can become, uh, uh, you know, quick, uh, quick to make and quick to eat. Fundamentally, what we're talking about is this whole uh, uh, refined flour revolution, which has taken over the world, right? From whether it's a pizza or a burger or a bread or a kulcha. So personally, I'm not, I, I don't, um, you know, go into national, you know, that nationalistic fervor about food that anything which is Indian is good and anything which is Western is bad. I don't follow that philosophy. So a samosa would be as harmful off the street as a pizza from a, you know, what a cafeteria. But yes, what we're talking about is convenience food. So see, yeah. anything that's convenient, uh, which is quick to make has to be, uh, the, the top layer has to be taken off. The fiber has to be taken off. Like you have quick cooking oats and you have breads, which is convenient. You don't have to make a roti. So finally, what, what is really happening is we are living in an era of globalization and convenience. Right. So anything which is convenient will be picked up. And anything which is not convenient, 
uh, will not be picked up. So even if it's okay. healthy, so if you have to walk an extra block to get your, uh, uh, you know, a healthy food, you will just go down to the cafeteria. You have 10 minutes to eat your lunch. You will go to the cafeteria, have that greasy samosa or kulcha or whatever, and go back to your classes. So like right. what Dr. Mitchell very clearly pointed out is, you know, it's easy to, to say, oh, these youngsters don't know how to eat well. Or it's easy to say, oh, why don't they eat? Why don't the others eat well? But the reality is that there's, the environment is obesogenic. If today you and I have to eat healthy, we really have to either carry our tiffins. And that also in the summer heat at 44 degrees, I mean, what can you carry? Eventually, it, it, it gets spoiled. So the, the whole issue with healthy eating is that uh, it, how do we make it uh, exciting? How do we make it convenient? How do we make it... Uh, uh, appetizing and healthy and, and culturally appropriate. Like, for example, I still remember, I mean, and, and it must be happening, but I remember that when we went to school, at that time, there were some kids who would come in from very traditional families and they were getting this puri chola and the other kids would laugh. So, you know, there is a cultural thing also which happens, right. there's a bullying which happens in school. So if you carry a parantha to school, you're not cool. So you, what I'm trying to say is, that it's not just one aspect which is so simple that we do this and so like for example you know when a patient comes to us they are at that point where they already have multiple disorders and now it's a life and death so they follow but if you go uh, to the earlier part of the story you know when things are not wrong everything is fine it's very hard to make right choices because then the, the priority list is I need to do A, B, C, D. I need to get to office. I need to look out. I need to get my kids to school. And I'll right. just eat whatever is convenient. So I think that's where the whole problem is. That when you look at fast foods, they're very convenient. You can yeah. order them anywhere. They're available everywhere. They are delicious when you eat them. They come hot. And that's where it's harder to get rid of all these things because they they just fit the lifestyle. Absolutely. Um you know, I like to take a question now, um, Dr. Vittal, but you're all welcome to uh, pitch in. Uh, Laila has written from New Delhi and she's saying, what are your views regarding non-vegetarian diet? The vegan movement condemns it totally. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to see the overall uh, constitution of our diet. Uh, and we do require adequate protein in the diet. And uh, it's very, very hard actually and uh, you know um, the experts will help me here but it's not that easy to get adequate amount of protein in a vegetarian diet unless you are consciously making an effort right so there is nothing really against as far as i am concerned nothing against non vegetarian food there is nothing against the fact you can that is an individual choice if you're going right. to go vegan, you go vegan, but make sure you're getting your calcium from somewhere. Make sure you're okay. getting your protein from somewhere. But if you're able to do the overall food constitution within the defined parameters, I'm OK with that. But it is harder to do that without in vegan uh, food environments and vegan food practices. And it is uh, definitely usage or consumption of non vegetarian food uh, gives us a flexibility of adding the right kind of protein, especially when we talk of fish and uh, chicken to some extent, uh, without adding fat. So that I think is a is a, is, is a great thing. But if you're going to cook non-vegetarian food the way most of us like it in the Mughlai or Avdi style with, you know, with butter, which is butter chicken, which uh, was the main choice of people on Christmas Eve in our house. So so <laughs> if you're going to do that, if you're going to do that, then then it becomes like, you know, a very high fat kind of meal. But otherwise, if you use chicken and fish, it's good. I have nothing against non-vegetarian food. But these are individual choices so people should do what they think is it but overall calorie constitution is very very important calorie protein fat the whole thing and micronutrients so right. if you're doing that with vegan managing that with vegan it's okay fair enough that's fair enough um you know you talked about intermittent food dr uh, mittal i'm coming back to you again um some, who's, who's this? Anu Peshavriya has written from Mumbai. I want to know how healthy is how healthy intermittent diet is if one wants to follow it for different reasons. Overall, intermittent fasting is not necessarily a bad principle. 
it's there is a lot of thing about intermittent fasting it's one of the few kinds of diets which has two things in its favor now there's a lot of science accumulating behind it because people are seriously researching it number even the new england journal of medicine carried a review which is most unusual and the second is the fact that it's been there since time immemorial if you if you read buddha's preachings he says i never had dinner don't eat after 4 pm 5 pm yeah. what i'm yeah. saying is that there is some logic in it it's not crazy number one straight away it reduces your calorie intake and number two if you're fasting long enough and in there are many forms of intermittent fasting i'm talking of the common form of 16 hours fast and eight hours eating but there are many many variants five days a month or two days a week and let's not do i mean let's not talk of that right now i'm sure she's asking about this so perhaps when you go beyond 13 14 hours fast then there is a breakdown of of stored energy in the body and that's how you lose your fat a little bit and that's the principle behind intermittent fasting so but not everyone can do intermittent fasting you cannot do intermittent fasting in our environment for example if you're taking drugs that lower blood sugar you know, you can't do it definitely not with insulin, definitely not with other. So you have to ask your doctor. You probably can't do it if you get a lot of uh, upper GI discomfort, acidity because of empty stomach. That's also a challenge. So a lot of things need to be discussed. But out of the, the fashionable modes of diet, I think intermittent fasting is the most relatively the most uh, rational. And there is a lot of experience and some science also behind it. So I wouldn't rule okay. it out. If someone wants to do it, I'll say, Try it if she doesn't fall into a category where it is not allowed. Okay, okay. Um, Shikhan, uh, you know, two questions, um, similar question. One is by Sheila Bhide from uh, Delhi and DC Pathak from Gunga. Um, uh, no, sorry, that is, uh, I think, well, anyway, the questions are about cooking oil. Um, you know, is it good to mix oils? Which are the good oils to make? And what are the good oils for diabetics? Uh, is uh, is uh, just thing you're asking me? Yes, I'm asking you. Uh, yeah, Shika. yeah, yeah. So uh, cooking oils is a wonderful thing. And uh, the first thing is that I think more than which oil you're using, the more important thing is how, how is the oil processed? And okay. I think Dr. Amrish had uh, mentioned this earlier. The one of the biggest problems today in uh, modern in uh, industrialization is the way food has been processed. So if you look mm -hmm. at a typical oil which comes on the shelves, it is basically hexane is added. It's a chemical. It's a, a petrochemical which is added to extract the oil from the oil seeds. And then uh, it is uh, it goes through a process of bleaching because normal oil actually has a lot of sediments and dark colored sediments. So on a, uh, on a shelf, on a supermarket shelf, you have to have that golden glistening oil, which is not natural. So it is put through a process of refining and bleaching and lots of other stuff which happens. If that is the kind of oil you're having, that's that's really unhealthy. The second is that there are tons and tons of palm oil which is imported from Malaysia and other countries. And palm oil is again refined in the same way which enters, which is entering into our kitchen. So like you have yes. this very jelly sounding uh, spray oil, uh, which you can spray and then you can just cook with like half a teaspoon of oil. All those are palm oils. So what I'm trying to say is that more than the oil, it is the way it has been processed. So the only good processed oil would be cold pressed oil, which is the traditional way. And you get a lot of cold pressed oils today in the market. That is one. Now, the second thing is which kind of oil. So it is as good as saying that should I only have wheat for the rest of my life because it's the best thing? Or should I only have rice because it's the best thing? So every oil has certain essential fatty acids. And all these right. essential fatty acids you need from different oils. So if I say that if uh, people just start having only uh, olive oil for the rest of their lives. Is that healthy? No, it is not because you need essential fatty acids from other uh, oils also. And in the same line, even ghee is important, but how much you're having, what quality of ghee you're having and uh, how are you cooking? I mean, are you? I still remember there was a patient and he said that, oh, my wife is so caring ever since I've had my heart attack. We have totally stopped eating ghee and even our puris are cooked in olive oil. So, oh. <laughs> So that's how people perceive that, oh, is this is, so you know what I'm trying to say? A lot of questions which come in are coming from a mindset of, is there a magical food? Is there a magical diet? Is there a magical oil? Which will fix everything. So what, we are, what I'm trying to say and what I think my other esteemed panelists are trying to say is that the magic is in the choices you're making. The magic is, right. are you conscious about what you're putting inside? 
uh, I always, and this is something which I've always talked to my patients uh, that you buy a Jaguar, would you put kerosene in it? You wouldn't. Yeah, you, you, you would go and put the you know the highest octane oil, uh, which is uh, you know gives you the best performance. But similarly, our cars are better than the Jaguars. You know, it's one of the most refined uh, equipment we carry the whole day. But what we do is we we don't eat mindfully, and I think it's yeah. very important to eat mindfully. Because once you're eating mindfully, even if you're not literate, I'm saying you're not literate, but you're eating mindfully, your intestine will give you the message. It will tell you because the intestine has the, after the brain, it has the highest nervous system. The innervation of the intestine is second to brain. And by the way, the number of bacteria inside is more than the human cell. So we are more bacteria than humans because they outnumber us. So our intestine is more bacteria than the number of DNA we carry. So there right. is actually intelligence happening at every cellular level. So if you yes. just eat mindfully, if you eat consciously, you will not go wrong. It's when we get on this whole thing that what is the latest uh, magic oil, what is the latest magic food, what is the latest magic diet, that's where we go wrong. Absolutely. You know, this reminds me here, IAC had uh, organized uh, a workshop and a talk with Thich Nhat Thian, uh, some years ago. And he did a session with the attendees where we were all given uh, fruit and apple, most of us. And before eating the apple, he said, now you talk to it, which most of us found very uncomfortable. And then um, interact with it, uh, take in the fragrance, and then take a bite. And I think that was the first time that most people realized that apples actually have a fragrance. So that was quite amazing. And that's quite a lesson in mindful eating. Isn't it? Well, I thought one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you're, it's, it's very important. In, in Japan, for example, uh, yeah. it's, uh, they encourage kids now during the recess, the 30 minute recess, they can't go out and play. They have to sit on the table and eat slowly. And okay. I think uh, one of the challenges that we had as a youngster, I mean, I used to take 30 seconds to finish my food, maybe a minute, but something else was more interesting and happening just out. So we learned the hard way. That's not the correct way. We need to absolutely be aware of what we are eating. You know, what is going in? Sometimes you don't know what's going in. What you think, and that's very American. You know, I was surprised when I first time went to the US many, many years ago with the with my professor. He said, let's grab first day. I found it very funny. Let's grab some. Let's grab a sandwich. Well, grabbing was a very negative. But anyway, let's grab a sandwich. And then he said, yeah, we can talk about the project on the way. So the, we are walking from one hospital block to another through the lovely uh, green grass of Harvard Medical School, munching on these big sandwiches. And I am trying to focus on not allowing it to fall or, or to talk. <laughs> what am I eating? So it's very American to just yeah. grab you know, quickly. And we've all gotten used to it. So I think mindful eating is very important. And we may not do it perfectly, but we must try. And the second Absolutely. thing is that, that what people forget is that, and with briefly Shikha mentioned, is that how we cook our foods make a big difference. Right. You know, how the Italians have their veggies. When I travel there and the veggies we have, I can have any amount of veggies. And how we make our veggies is not, not the same. And therefore, cooking makes a lot of difference to the taste, but also to the nutrition of a particular food. I, so I, I also suppose that because uh, our traditional cooking methods have also changed, now we depend on the pressure cooker that also kind of plays havoc with the, the kind of vegetables which could otherwise just be sauteed. And I suppose that is what is being done traditionally also. Not to talk about the curries and all, but uh, by and large for daily food. In, in general, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, both uh, Shikha and Kavita here, that in general, I think we cook our veggies too much. We sort of, we do too much with them. We should leave them alone, actually, and that'll be much nicer. <laughs> so. uh, you know, there's a question uh, which has come all the way from Ireland. Kathleen Cass writes in and she says, is diet education a part of the school curriculum in India? It should be you, you. You you talked about accessibility of healthy food in college and school canteens, but how about educating people about diet? So uh, I think the structured education plans 
have very limited information. They do have. They do have right. information about protein and about you know how much protein you need and what are proteins for, what are bodybuilding foods, what are fats for, the very basics. I don't think they really go beyond that to explain uh, you know in, in, a, in a sort of deeper way or dive right. deeper into this whole area of, of what foods are good for you. As far as I know, I don't think so. There have been many attempts. Like, you know, we do these workshops sometimes, and I know of friends who've written booklets on healthy eating distributed throughout schools in Lucknow, all those things. But they're add-ons. As part of the curriculum, I don't know how much information is imparted about healthy eating in food, mm -hmm. I, I, in school. I yeah. doubt it very much, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. My kids are very big, so I don't know. They're men. <laughs> you, know, you, <laughs> you know, you talk about um, how food is eaten in uh, Japanese schools, but they also have this tradition where uh, student pa uh, students participate in the, um, uh, you know, serving of the food, yes. of the cooking of the food, yes. and of cleaning the classrooms yes, cleaning. afterwards. Absolutely, so, always. So that always. is an entire process. Yes, absolutely. There's all there's all process, and it's part of their thing now, DNA. You can say because they just do it like that in, now. Yeah, you know, Justly, I just want to bring in and something this is which, uh, so uh, education on nutrition actually is one of the things which could be one of the most exciting portion of education. Like what I'm trying to say is that like, if I have to learn geography, I can't eat geography. I can't eat physics. I can't eat maths. But this is one area you can actually eat what we're learning. And that it can be a lot of fun because every day if you want to teach about vitamin A, you don't really need to uh, read about uh, tons of books on vitamin A, just eat a fruit, experience, savor the fruit, and then talk about what vitamin A is doing. So what I'm trying to say is, I think in an education system, which anyway needs a lot of reform, what I'm trying to say is nutrition is one area where you can actually have a lot of fun. If you want to right. eat somebody <laughs> about nutrition, the first thing is they should eat it. Even if it means eating a pizza and experiencing the bloating or the, the, the thaji, so nutrition is one subject which should be only it should be only a practical thing eat and experience although i won't uh, say go and yeah, have a i won't teach the kids to go and have a glass of wine if they want to understand about uh, you know foods like wine and alcohol but yes for the rest of the food i think it should yeah, when, be when the, yeah. when the time is right maybe even that yes you know? yes even that because what yeah, just, is that more and more world over they're talking about experiential education and not Wrote learning. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember anything I learned in school, frankly. I had to read. <laughs> Neither do I. Because at that, because you know, it was also books and, and just to get marks, it was all memory. We used to just memorize without really understanding anything. So I think uh, I think what you're saying is that somewhere our uh, children, of course, learn and especially the boys, um, learn how to participate in the process of uh, creating food, cooking chopping vegetables and all which normally we see in home science classes for, for girls but not so there is no such thing for boys and also the uh, you know to savor food which is what Thai taught us that you savor the food in every which way where of course later when they turn 18 they can also savor wine and uh, alcohol otherwise but to savor food I think that is where the crux is. No Shrika? Absolutely, and I think that is why it's important because you know when you when you uh, when you experience things, mm -hmm. you learn far better. But when you just memorize it, you do not actually. That's not learning. That is just memorizing, and there is a huge difference mm -hmm. between learning and memorizing. And that is mm -hmm. why the whole environment of nutrition has to start uh, uh, from both home and school. And in right. school, there has to be a way where people experience the whole. Uh, food, they experience nutrition, they experience good health. Because rather than uh, trying to memorize, oh, apple has this and banana has that, and you know, you just, you just enjoy it, you experience it, and that's, it, it stays with you forever. And it's like, like I say that, you know, in most of uh, management uh, colleges now, they hardly teach. What they're doing is they would do project work together. And that's mm -hmm. how you learn. I think that's the only way we all learn. We never learn by uh, by memorizing or uh, by uh, reading and rereading stuff. Absolutely, I agree with you, Doctor Mittal. You were saying something on the subject. No, no, no I'm fine with this. I, I I totally agree that our method of education overall has to be more experiential. There's no question about that, and. Clearly, uh, food and nutrition would be a very important area, which actually is quite neglected. 
and we yes. can start by at least having only healthy food in hospitals you absolutely know, in the in the cafeterias of hospitals it's not not always true not always true so i think those are in schools so the you know midday meals are given in so many schools we are uh, in, in in even in the fancy metropolitan schools you have uh, day schools where you have you you have food there so we can start by making those as an example and use those those tools to really educate children about uh, about nutrition so i think uh, i completely agree that's a very very important area i think we should uh, talk to kavita a little bit i i sorry, think we should sorry. and you know um, but i would like to ask you this one question you know yes. we are talking about the middle classes and the upper classes educated yes. classes and how what they can do but how how do we uh, how do we ensure that uh, the economically backward uh, people who are living in slums how how do they have access to nutrition because so nutrition think, in india is a big deal right now so i think we have to do away with some of the baggage that we carry for example uh, we have to make sure that everyone gets enough milk you know right. if all children get enough milk then we they won't be short of protein they won't be short of calcium and so many other things on top of that now the government has rightfully started fortifying milk and that's going to spread a lot in the next couple of years it's going to become mandatory uh, very soon right. so so if you uh, i'm giving an example so no society can afford to to make progress when 38% of our children are undernourished 38% now in this uh, environment so 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 it's very important that they get adequate protein adequate calories and 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 you know so you have to look at macronutrients and micronutrients there will be dependence on the economic uh, status of the person that you cannot take away but if you can make again i'm giving example of milk and eggs i mean cheaper than anything milk should be cheaper than water True. as an example for children and eggs should also be really cheap so everyone can have enough protein they don't have eggs it's okay there are other issues but but what i'm saying is there it is very much possible to do that awesome. so and and these things with the fortification program coming in in a big way and that's been one of the major changes in the last few years we've seen we'll get a lot of micronutrients vitamin a vitamin d fortified milk and edible oil you know you're doing uh, you're doing uh, uh, rice and wheat also fortified with other stuff with iron yeah. so a lot of things are happening salt uh, fortified with iodine that's a big iron. success story so yeah. we, those things that should just be there. there there's no choice you know there Absolutely. so you have to use different yeah. approaches for different uh, yeah. yeah in fact you know this is the next question which is coming from deepthi gulati uh, we are all promoting oil fortification and um, is it bad for us or good for us no no fortified, no, fortified uh, everything is good because it's been done with a great deal of care and lot of discussion and groups and expert groups and and points and counterpoints and by and large we followed models that are already proven worldwide and yeah. i have been sort of involved as an advocate of fortification uh, uh, not directly in the execution part of it and i think for example my personal passion was vitamin d and we know how low vitamin d is in indians so the fact that many dairies are now adding d to milk and yes. a also and and it's going to become mandatory is is a big deal and same with edible oils so i think yes. uh, fortification of foods is the way forward there's no question about it for micronutrient deficiencies fantastic i hope it happens soon uh, kavita um, what are the desi foods that we can have um, for for all these problems that we have at the moment vitamin d the other minerals you talk about uh, micronutrients how do we, how how do we do it with local food see for vitamin d the biggest problem is uh, that there aren't too many foods that have vitamin d in it which is why fortification will be the game changer and is the yeah. game changer the aunt i mean you have become go out in the sun yeah either you go and sit out in the sun and the irony is we live in the sunniest country of the world yet we right. probably are most deficient in vitamin d that is because that's how our chemistry works the body uh, you know the indian uh, genes work 
So why for vitamin D, you have to look at fortification or spend some time in the sun. Both are easy to do. Fortification, the government is taking care of. FSSCI is doing, doing wonderful work. And sitting in the sun is the easiest thing to do, frankly speaking. Okay. So yeah. there I can't really suggest a food. But for other nutrients, you know, the whole idea, which is, you know, the whole point is that there, every food is good for us. That's what I keep trying to, uh, you know, reiterate again and again in the book as well. Every food has something good happening in it. But there are certain foods that have the goodness, which is loaded in extreme amounts. You know, the right. nutrients in them, the vitamins, the minerals that we need, and even the antioxidants, which we really haven't spoken about today, which are actually mm -hmm. disease preventers. Some foods have more of those. So those foods right. are the ones we categorize as superfoods. Although the definition is a little vague, you'll find like maybe 100 definitions on Google if you go. You know, everyone so what has is your definition. What is your definition of superfood? There are two ways of identifying a superfood. One is a food which gives you a particular nutrient in huge amounts. So maybe it's a super, uh, you know, loaded food in vitamin A. That is yeah. a superfood by definition. Or there could be a food that gives you multiple nutrients, a whole lot of them in good amounts. So both ways you could identify a food as superfood. So yeah. my point is that today, the only way to make sure that we prevent disease and to ensure that we don't really get deficiency is to eat those, these foods that are so loaded that you know they are almost like a medi medication, but far yeah. better for us. You know, better than a supplement because they're natural. So right. the idea is to plate all the foods that are really good for us and fit in this definition of superfood. And mm -hmm. they can be AC or they can be Videshi, literally, you know. Yeah, yeah. Whatever fits your pocket, whatever fits your, you know, lifestyle. But the point is to consciously plate them. And if you keep eating these foods that are so intrinsically good for you, you will naturally yeah. take care of, you know, preventing disease. My whole point is that I, we didn't speak about it today. The whole discourse worldwide and particularly in India has to change from curative to preventive. Right. Yeah. Right now, we only wait for the disease to happen and then start thinking about it, you know. Then foods can't really work because right. they're not pills, you know. So if we change the discourse, the thought process, and for that matter, policy also has to change when fortification fits in there very well to preventive. Yeah. The whole idea will change. The absolutely. Change, absolutely. That's what I would like to say. Yeah, in fact, uh, why I didn't ask you that particular question was because, you know, we've read the book and we are going on the premise that we are talking about foods which uh, are, are are good for us. Yes. Uh, and that, that that is why about this uh, well-balanced diet. So the book has, you know, basically in the book, what I've done is uh, there are 40 foods which I've explained in detail. Right. But then I've also given some fixed solutions. You've read right. the book. You know. I've read the book. I love the book. Yeah, proven uh, solutions, small uh, solutions, which work very well, uh, mm -hmm. which are mentioned for everything, for low BP and for... Uh, but these are all preventive, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. You can't have very high sugar and hope that just having uh, methi seeds water in the morning will get you off the medicines. That's right. not going to happen. But if you know you have a family history or if you borderline pre-diabetic and you start having karela juice, you know, bitter gourd juice and maitra yeah. seeds and a little bit of cinnamon in your diet, you could prevent it. So there is a difference. People need to understand that difference, which is why rather than, like Shikha said, people come to us when they already have like five problems in their, you know, body. It's better. I really like people who call up and say that we need just one consultation to understand what we could be doing wrong already right. and what we can how we can just change that you know the whole point is that yeah. this one consultation could probably save them one year down the line doing a full three month weight loss course mm -hmm. so the whole attitude has to change from curative to preventive and foods are oh, a you are smiling food. away um uh, dr mittal Sorry, no. I think she's absolutely right. The reason the reason is that this happens every day. People yeah. want, uh, what should I do now that I've got diabetes? I've got this, and then they move from there. 
but very yeah. few people ask you <coughs> are willing to follow anything as part of a healthy diet so we all right. we've stopped using the word diabetic diet completely it's not used anymore yeah. okay it's just a healthy diet it's a diet plan mm -hmm. but it's not a diabetic diet what we were used to writing in 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 college you know diabetic diet so many calories it means nothing it's just a healthy diet so people if they followed the healthy diet they wouldn't become diabetic in the first place so that's the thing absolutely so so <laughs> this is something you also said earlier when we we, we were doing our test um, um a run of this uh, webinar that there is no such thing anymore of a diabetic diet or a or a cancer diet or any any specific disease oriented diet isn't it so so no if you have advanced kidney disease for example then of course you would yeah. need some modification if you have advanced if you've reached a certain level of disease then diet will have to be modified but by yeah. and large no by and large there is not much with the same diet works for heart same for kidney same for liver same for everything uh, so so we have to balance it out people talk about osteoporosis that's another of my areas of interest the yeah. lot of role of diet and osteoporosis what is the role of diet and osteoporosis you need to take enough protein right you need to need to take enough calcium enough vitamin d and then there are other little, little things and antioxidants you know with fruits and all so all you have to do is the basics again which are in any case good for you so so yeah. uh, it's not that you can do different diets for different diseases it has to be a healthy diet and a prevention of disease diet rather than treating a disease diet so that is really the thumb rule no? for all diseases ensure yes. that you have a, a more or less balanced diet yes and that kind of works as a preventive absolutely yes okay uh, shikha i want to ask you this question which is coming uh, dr mittal talked about uh, flagging of milk and for uh, she said thank you dr mittal for flagging milk fortification and oil fortification but she's asked this question to shikha ji and says um, you you said of course you did but that is the question that refined oil is bad so you need to clarify what you said so uh, fundamentally when the whole process of refining happens it is the process which is a problem right right now so when we talk about process when we say cold pressed oil cold pressed right. oil means it has been uh, processed uh, by crushing the oil seeds and the oil that is that is the oil you're consuming but when we say that <clears throat> in the refining we are using hexane to extract oil from the seeds that is an outside chemical like for example let's look at the sugar wheat or right. the uh, the sugar which is available in the supermarkets that white sugar do you think sugar comes naturally as that color no it is bleached so right. a bleaching agent is, now if you really look at uh, i mean if you look at uh, so to uh, give a short answer by refining A refined oil is bad because refined oil. You have to look at the way it was refined. Right. Refined is a very English word. I mean, in the sense it has been refined. But refined how? Has it been mm -hmm. refined the traditional way? Has it been refined in factories using hexane? That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at how the oil has been. But I mean, I would use the word, word processed. And right. if you really see, I mean, you know, I mean, if you look at a lock and a key, there is a lock and there is a key. We all. all of us and all the plants and organic uh, we are all composed of carbon hydrogen oxygen in fact almost mm -hmm. 40% of our body is composed of oxygen what are we we are just molecules attached in carbon hydrogen oxygen different different structures and if you really look at there was a there was a time when trans fats were in vogue why because during world war 2 when most of these areas were bombed and and the, and you know the cows were slaughtered uh, there was a shortage of oil there was shortage of uh, butter so what they did is to make bakery items they they pushed hydrogen gas through mm. normal vegetable oil and converted into a solid oil which looked uh, like uh, ghee which looked like butter right. but what they forgot was that in nature and including our dna and dr mittal can correct me if i got it wrong that most of us have a cis structure right that means that the molecules one is arranged here suppose this is this is the main structure one is arranged here the other is arranged here and in the yes. trans structure both the molecules were arranged only at one place now what okay. imagine the havoc it causes when it goes into our body cycle when the metabolic cycle look at the havoc it will cause because now that you're you're entering an element is entering which is ulta the trans is opposite of what mm -hmm. it should have been because 
because all the molecules are aligned only on one side, whereas it had to be on two other sides. So the key right. is wrong. And now what is happening is because this element has entered the body, it will go and sit somewhere. So it will go and sit in your heart, in the vessels of your heart. It will go and sit in your liver, where we'll call fatty liver or non-alcoholic liver, you know, steatosis. Or it will go and sit in your joints and cause arthritis. Or it will go and sit in your lungs and cause allergy and inflammation. Now, it right. took almost a decade for research to find out that these trans fats, which are ultra fats, are causing the heart disease. Because till that, yes. everything got blamed. All the oils got blamed. Mm. And the offender was trans fats. Because in the diet, a lot of trans fats had come in. So what I'm trying to say is that how we process our food is critical. And more and more conversations are required around how we are processed. So look, the, the white salt you eat in your kitchen, it is bleached. There's a bleaching agent in there. The white sugar, which we uh, you know add uh, to tea and coffee, it is bleached. So there's a bleaching agent there. So you're eating the sugar plus the bleaching agent. You look at any right. packet. You, so you, you have guests. You give them biscuits and you give them something. You look at the, the other side of the uh, this thing. There is a color because the biscuit would not come out that color and not stay that way. It would have preservatives, it would have chemicals, it would have emulsifiers. So I think majority of your diet is chemicals coming out of a factory. Right. Right. And that's why what you said earlier, it's important to, uh, for, for especially for youngsters, to get involved with the process when they, when they do it in school or at home. Uh, they, they understand the process and then they can look at larger things like how factory-made biscuits and other food items are prepared. It's a you know, we are coming... You know, it's the yeah. same example of a kerosene and jaguar. You know, ultimately, we all have to decide. We have this jaguar, which we got as a gift. Now, do we put kerosene or do we put the best kind of fuel for it? I mean, it's a, it's a fundamental choice. We, at one point of time in our lives, we have to make that choice. Yeah. And, you know, that's a great metaphor because for each one of us, no matter what car we drive, it is a jaguar. Similarly, our body... Well, no matter what shape or size it is, it is our Jaguar. So we have to ensure that uh, we um, give it the right fuel. Uh, you know, we are coming to the end of this. We are already a little um, over time. So I'll do a quick fire, very quick um, questions to all, uh, all of you. And just get short answers so that people can benefit from it. The first one to you, Kavita. What are the top immunity boosting foods everyone should eat? I think that's all I've been talking about since the corona started. <laughs> Immunity has been a huge buzzword and everyone wants these quick. But then there are some foods which do help, of course. And my top, yeah. I could quickly tell you, uh, tulsi mm. leaves, garlic, onions, uh, then, uh, you know, some uh, form of protein. So most of us, are, most people are vegetarians. So I would add lentils here, right. carrots, carrots for vitamin A. And turmeric. We can't forget turmeric. I mean, of course, not excess, like Dr. Mitchell mentioned, but some turmeric definitely can help you. So all of these, there are these six foods. And out of these, if you can have even three a day, I think you'll be fine. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, do, are there any strict no-no foods uh, for diabetic? Well, obviously, the food that is at the top of the list is uh, for avoiding, uh, for to be avoided in diabetes is, is anything that is overtly sweet, sugar. I mean, that's to be avoided by everybody, but it's almost like a poison for people with diabetes. So you can have the odd sweet, but anything that tastes sweet and has sugar, you know, the connection between sugar and India is 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 very, it's a very old connection. And actually, sugar is derived from sharkara. The word okay. is from Sharkara. And, and when Alexander invaded India, then he was amazed to find that people were making these crystals out of uh, pressing a reed-like structure and then drying that fluid. And, and he took sugar back with him to Europe. His army did. And actually, before that, they only knew honey as, as a sweetener. So we have a huge contribution. So the issue is that, that sugar, 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 so, so sugar has actually to be avoided. If it's one thing, yes, it has to be refined carbohydrate and sugar. So what you're really saying is sugar has to be avoided, but not sweet. No, I mean, sweet, you can't have sweet things unless there is actual sugar. No? So anything that contains 
meetha like sugar without it 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 obviously is not good for us not good for anybody so i'm not saying you kill your taste buds completely but you'll have to balance it out i cannot say yes it's okay for you it's good for you if you have diabetes and you take simple sugars or refined carbohydrates your sugar is going to sh go shooting up there's nothing you can do about it and it'll be very very hard to manage with uh, your adjustment of medication so yes overtly sweet things should be minimized in the diet but you can like replace it with fruits uh, fruits are nature's candy you know yeah. fruits and nature's candy so you can do again a sort of calculated amount but you can do enough fruit to keep to satiate your uh, taste buds okay um i i um shikha what are the three most important rules of eating food right for weight loss since that's your forte <laughs> yeah so the first thing i would say is uh, like uh, which was mentioned uh, you know buddha didn't eat after a point you know dinners he didn't eat i wish i'd read buddha before i would have uh, made a lot more simple <laughs> slimmer uh, i i only discovered i stumbled upon it during my practice i didn't know about it so that is uh -huh. one rule that don't eat uh, late at night the second uh, rule of weight loss is that uh, eat as much fiber as you can because fiber is a, is an automatic you can say a, a signal for the body to uh, to stop eating when it's full so natural fiber is only found in natural foods which is natural grains and everything so fiber is actually a good a key to eating right uh, any food okay. which has fiber is uh, good and anything which is refined and processed which would include sugars and all that everything would be covered in that the third thing okay. i would say is that we are uh, 60 uh, two third water we are actually two two third of our bodies are water so it's very important to make sure that you're drinking enough water because in in big cities you don't drink enough water and that's one of the issues and therefore tr try if you uh, could uh, step up drinking to uh, two liters of water every day that would really take care of a lot of things hydration is very very essential and many times when you're hungry you're not hungry you're actually thirsty so it's good to, yeah you're good to have so those are the top three things of course there are many but those are the top three things Okay, now since uh, you know um, the vaccine has been created and we are looking forward to a new year which is Corona free, but what has been the major takeaway for each one of you um, about the pandemic and how to overcome whatever is happening to us? I'll start with you, Shika. Okay, so I think uh, 2020 for me personally was a blessing in disguise. Because my okay. first learning was that I needed to step back and reflect on my priorities, which I did. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, it was a blessing in disguise for the for I would say for for people because I think healthcare has been always a second priority for most people. You know, on top of their list are their financial goals and then their other desires. And health is always something because most people, any country, and unfortunately, any country I go to, they say healthcare should be completely subsidized by the government. And right. it should come, you know, it's almost like health is like a parent who should bail you out when you've done everything wrong. So I'm glad <laughs> that people are looking at uh, healthcare more seriously and people actually are talking to doctors. Otherwise, you know, we are only, a lot of my patients would come to me and say, just fix this. I said, no, I need your participation to fix your problem. I can't, I don't have a magic pill for you. So I'm yeah. glad uh, Corona has forced people to rethink their priorities and healthcare has stepped up on their priorities. I mean, it's still not the superstar, but I'm hoping it'll become a superstar one day. And number three, I, I also realized is that, uh, you know, I think we, uh, a lot of us who are type A's, we just uh, think too much, do too much. Life can be simplified. And right. now I'm, I'm, this is my takeaway that I can, simplify life and and have a richer life rather than trying to do too much all the okay. time okay that's, that, that, that's good that's wonderful inspiring i hope other people uh, listen to you and decide they have to do the same things dr mittal so i guess uh, at the professional level it was a hugely challenging year and right. the effort was to be able to continue to provide service to are chronic care patients who require us and who will not be able to reach us because they don't have an acute problem and we are ourselves no. saying don't come. so i think we worked very hard on that the whole team has been absolutely brilliant and we've sort of connected with all our patients we do video consults mm -hmm. with them we do email consults and we've developed a very good system for that 
So even mm -hmm. now, uh, half my uh, consults are now video consults, half are actually physical consults in the hospital. So people from Begu Sarai or, or you know, or, or uh, Darjeeling or, or if, wherever, Lucknow, they are able to yeah. connect with us uh, through this. And even those living next door can connect. So one has yeah. been uh, the, the advent of telemedicine in a big way and using modern technology to provide good care, care at the mm -hmm. doorstep. We say diabetes care at your doorstep. That's that's the thing we're trying to propagate. Number one, at a personal level, I have discovered Delhi. So what I've okay. done is that I have, I have, I have uh, every Sunday, at least if not more, I go for these long walks in all historical areas which are not on the main map. Right. And and all the biodiversity parks and click and crazy amount of pictures. And that has really cleared my head. So I can actually be a tour guide for you in Delhi if you want to go and visit any pre mughal monuments or pre those <laughs> monuments where are they hidden where are the bricks lying where are the stones lying uh, that's been very satisfying in fact you've been posting a lot of those pictures um, on facebook and giving us a taste of what <laughs> delhi is all about <laughs> so all of you who are watching this go to facebook look for dr amrish mittal and you will get another view of delhi <laughs> Uh, I'm going to end this uh, conversation with Kavita uh, with a question. We know the answer because your book is very brilliantly structured. But, um, you know, Surya Nandini from Delhi has asked this question. Um, oh, I missed the quote. I don't know where the question went. But basically, she said, why should one buy the book? What's so unique about it? The USP, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I would not say why. why uh, I mean, I'll answer this indirectly. First, Dr. Mittal, I've been, you've been a tour guide to me because I've been following you on Twitter. So I've been looking at all your pictures. So I would like to <laughs> thank you for that. And because I learned a new word from you today, ulta fat. And I love that. Yeah. <laughs> fat. Fat to ulta fat, I think the whole of the country will identify more with it and be more scared of it. So I personally right. think that's a lovely word that you've just thrown today in this webinar, and that's the takeaway for me, definitely. And now to answer the question, like I never tire of saying that this is the one body we're going to get. We will not get another body. So we have to make the most of it. And right. like I said in the beginning in, in of the webinar, sometime during the webinar as well, was that the only tool at our disposal is the food that we eat. You can't control the pollution. You can't control the policies. You can't control even stress to quite an extent. Right. But all of these, the damage that all of this causes to our body can be offset to quite an extent by the kind of food that you're eating. So right. you have to make intelligent, right choices. Right. And just for that, I think it will be a good read for you because it's not a boring read. It's a fun read, if I may say so myself. And there are a lot of fun facts in there as well. So it's not just Gyan alone. It's easy. And if you read one chapter at a time, you'll probably keep falling in love with one food at a time. And that's what I've tried to do there. And there are lots of yes, recipes. I mean, like Shikha yeah, said, there are, it has yeah. to be interesting and fun. So there are a lot of fun recipes as there as well. Yeah. And also the way you structured it, there, there are, you know, these are everyday foods. You talk about jamun and bhalsa and singara. These are fruits, uh, foods and vegetables that we see at the local uh, sabji bala. And uh, to understand that there is a gla glamorous element to that. And then you've given these lovely little anecdotes and tidbits and trivia about uh, each food and fruit, how it's developed or come to India. And of course, as you said, there are the uh, recipes that one can follow. So the, the entire package is very interesting. And I, I'm going to use Dr. Mittal's words again. It's zexy. It makes food interesting. Yes. And on that note, uh, is there any comment anyone would like to make before we end this session? I would say the same, you have been a wonderful moderator because uh, the way you have navigated three diverse, uh, you know, panelists, <laughs> so well, it looks like you all are doing the same thing and that's so wonderful because, uh, yes, of course, and I think you've been a wonderful moderator. Thank you for moderating. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mittal, any last words? Just that this has been a lot of fun. I, I yeah. need to get back to work. This was really nice. One of the <laughs> nicest webinars I've yeah. done. So thank you so much. And Kavita, thank you. You've given us a lovely book to talk about. And um, we hope to do another webinar soon with 
some other book of yours. And I want to thank all the people who joined in this webinar from all across the world. And thank you, Shika, Kavita, and uh, Dr. Mittal. Thank you so much for being on this webinar. Thank you, Christine. Thank Pleasure. You. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Done. We can sign out.